Great. Um, I apologize. Uh, might have some issues with with my connection. It's been happening since yesterday night. Whoops. Too soon. Too soon. <laughs> um, okay. So the title of my presentation today is um, Redefining Immersive Archives from Banksy's Dismal Land to Takuma's Kuikuro's Topographic Projections of Indigenous Cultural Heritage. But before I begin, um, I would like to acknowledge the conference organizers and support staff. They have been amazing and working so hard at bringing this together. I think it's, it's just been a success. Um, so thank you so much for that. Mm. I would also like to acknowledge the ancestral and traditional territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit, Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and Huron-Wendat, who are the original owners and custodians on, uh, of the land on which I uh, stand and, and create today. So I was considering the new digital reality of pervasive Zoom meetings and conferences as well, um, and thought what better way to counter that um, by beginning my talk with one of my favorite metaphors for uh, from um, of immersivity from Joseph and Michon, where immersivity is compared to being submerged in water. And I'm, I'm going to leave it right there. In many ways, it's a perfect metaphor because it conveys that there are intricate multimodal economies at play whenever a subject enters an immersive environment. And that by trying to approximate it, we're defining immersivity as an event, perhaps an archive-like uh, series of events that provide a heightened level of plasticity and transformative potential, um, uh, almost in Catherine Malibu's sense. The introduction of new visual media storytelling practices and technologically framed spatial aesthetics have also influenced how we individually and culturally experience immersive narratives and specifically site-specific um, site and site-responsive narratives in the forms of installations, theater performances, community-based collaborations, and, and many, if not most, of the examples that were brought up in, in this conference as well. In addition to the use of textual, linguistic, spatial, oral, haptic, and um, many other modes of storytelling, Sophisticated installations and theatrical productions, um, such as Dismal and by Banksy, Sleep No More um, by Punch Drunk, Kiss and Cry, and the topographic projection installation by Takuma Kuekuro um, that I'm looking at today, play with the often uncanny um, effective economies, framing site-specific and site-responsive storytelling, reassembling them into a form not unlike that of an immersive archive. And here, I think it's important to note that the term archive is being used quite intentionally, not as a static space of record keeping, linearity, linear narrative, um, and preservation, but rather in its contemporary form, as a multimodal space of rhizomatic narrative building, narrative memory, narrative affect, um, immersivity, and cultural critique. So the four examples I'm looking at, Dismal and Sleep No More, Kiss and Cry, and um, Takuma Kuikuro's installation are relying on different forms of multimodal fragmentation. And in some instances, technological interventions in order to redefine how we view, process, um, interpret, interact, and sometimes memorialize complex personal, cultural, and um, counter hegemonic narratives and ideas. These examples differ from each other insofar as they range from collaboration-based installations to theatrical productions. So they're quite different from each other, but all of them use methodologies that employ a degree of multimodal fragmentation and intervention in some instances within their storytelling. That is fragmentation and interventionality are used to first build the narrative framework and then immerse or submerge in kind of Josephine Michon's sense um, into the new realm. So the first example is Dismaland. Um, Dismaland, the amusement park, or as the advertisement announced it, UK's most disappointing new visitor attraction was constructed on the site of a decommissioned swim park in the UK. So for five weeks um, in the summer of 2015, Dismaland became a site-specific reimagining of a Disney castle attraction turned apocalyptic. In the upper right corner, you, you can see the aerial view of, um, of, of Dismaland. So this installation promised to be an immersive commentary on a number of themes, consumerism, globalism, um, popular culture, immigration, um, 
celebrity culture and militarization. Here's uh, a good example of, of that latter one. Um, here's another excellent one, kind of a homage to uh, Alfred Hitchcock's uh, The Birds. And my personal favorite, the carousel, or it's kind of, um, my, my colleagues and I would joke, it's not human made carousel, but human grade. And you can see the human grade lasagna in the background, really, really good installation. Combining 10 graffiti features by Banksy and works by 58 other global artists. So it's a very, very much a collaborative effort. Dismaland also included Banksy staples such as the TSA-esque uh, security screening and exit through the gift shop, um, various brochures um, talking about kind of the chronic leisure sur sur surplus, impossible games, Occupy protests, and um, various Dismaland employees that you can see one here in the background of um, kind of a version of the twist on the little mermaid fairy tale. There's one in the background. The visitors of this dystopian amusement park were invited to experience an uncanny fragment, uh, fragmented version of distorted narratives, capturing familiar themes, practices, um, and tropes in unfamiliar settings. A site-specific intervention posing as an apocalyptic amusement park and a narrative maze dense with uncanny multimodality. This installation was recorded by numerous visitors who then posted it online as 300 degree um, multiple archives. Some of them are still online. Available as a record for those who were unable to partake in the amusement. The real and imaginary of the installation continuing to exist in a, in a kind of feedback loop uh, both as a space of multimodal storytelling and as Dismaland's own grotesque critique. So uh, great take on, uh, on immersivity. My second example, and I'll be very brief on this one, um, is a Sleep No More production by Punch Drunk. I'm sure it's familiar to many of you. And it's another great example of immersivity for, through fragmentation, a production that began in 2011 and was still ongoing up until uh, it was put on hold due to COVID-19, so almost 10 years. And it is a site-specific production that juxtaposes a rendering of Shakespeare's Macbeth with a found footage style five-story accidental archive in the form of a pre-World War II McKittrick Hotel. Uh, this is, uh, you can see on the screen, an example of one of the rooms, and there were more than 100 um, different spaces, uh, anything from kind of a padded room in a quote-unquote Arkham Asylum to, you know, the hotel settings of different kinds. This is sort of a witch's den right here. In a characteristic punch drunk production, it introduces multimodal fragmentation as part of its narration, including the fragmentation of fictional and non-fictional narratives, overlapping spaces and fragmented boundaries of roaming audience, very, uh, from, very common in punch drunk productions, enforced through the immersivity of the masked experience. And if we, are, if, if we want, we can talk more about it in the Q&A. Uh, so one can argue that the mask offers a phenomenological augmented reality experience in this particular case. Now, moving on to, here's uh, an image of the audience and the performers. Okay. So moving away from the roaming audience um, type of installation, my third example is a site responsive or site conscious collaborative digital installation developed in Brazil in spring of 2017 by Takuma Kuikuro with technology artist Adam Lowe and uh, cartographic history scholar Jerry Broaden. I'm going to show a couple more. So this is um, an in progress um, image just to give you an idea how how the collaboration and relationships being built. Um, we developed and here's them they're setting up uh, some of the drones used for the for the installation at a time when brazil is experiencing so many policy shifts and how indigenous art is being supported or actually not um, the this installation combined 3d maps of um, the Cuicuro indigenous territories in jingo with technologies capable of recording partial qualities of at-risk cultural heritage from images and sounds to local artifacts and architecture. Um, the phrasing used by the indigenous and non-indigenous members of that collaboration was not only about preservation 
strengthening global awareness, even promotion, which are kind of keywords that we often hear in, in, in collaborations. So for the Jingu collaboration there, they were trying to create interactive assets with technologies. And I think that there's a, the language suggests a kind of paradigmatic shift in, turn of, in terms of what they were trying to accomplish there. This was a very special project for uh, Kuikura people in Jingu, uh, since this was the very first outside contact that they ever had. Um, and the very first instance of the artistic residency in Jingu ever, as part of the collab collaborative project, social change through creativity and culture. A different approach to immersivity, certainly, and immersive art collaborations it began with transformative dialogues and generative exchange that aimed to arrive at a set of ideas and community-based protocols about how and why, or even if at all, um, technology is being used in art and art making. Here's kind of a, an in-progress shot, and, and there's some interesting things happening with the outside-inside boundaries. Um, um, the creation of the 3D maps that brought the various audiovisual fragments of uh, Kuikuru territories allowed the community to explore as well as take control of how Indigenous communities can convey their evolving experiences of life to contemporary deba uh, debates about Brazilian economic and social development. A 3D feral la uh, laser scanner was used by Takuma to digitally record certain aspects of Kuikuru at risk cultural heritage, as well as integrate practices and affects um, sounds of being in the community, of being on the land, um, of creating art collaboratively in, in, into the installation um, as the final outcome. And here you can see um, one of the team members recording the sound of um, cleaning like a, a root vegetables, something that they do every day. And in this, this is an image of another sound that they were recording. So. Um, the sound of hands engaging different textures. The outcome was an immersive archive of the uh, Kuikura cultural heritage. However, it was also something else as well. Um, it was also a living archive in a sense that it came out of the collaboration build with a lived site responsive methodology in place. The outcomes of the artistic exchange were presented to the public during the Creative Lab in Jingu, Art Technology and Culture Preservation. And if you want to learn more about this, you, you, you can look up the documentary about the artistic residency um, on the People's Palace um, Project website. Now, my final example, I know I'm sorry, we're running out of time here, starting to run out of time. Um, is Kiss and Crime that was created by Michelle and Demay and uh, Jacques Van Dormel around 2011 and then it toured um, almost into 2015. It is an immersive theatrical production simultaneously combining the frenetic process of filming and setting up with, with a narrative portrayed exclusively using human hands and fingers dancing on miniature landscapes, kind of their flawless narrative uh, projected onto the screen using a live video feed. And you can see that in progress. So the screen, the audience, we, we have the audience perspective here. Um, Kiss and Crime is an immersive theatrical experience that plays with doubling, spatial fragmentation, experience of multimodality and technology as intervention. Um, Michelle Anne DeMay wrote that, you know, from her perspective, this particular um, theatrical production was so atypical and so intense because the audience watches a feature film being made live and because the main characters are hands. But I, I don't think that does it justice. Yes, it's an instantaneous feature film pushing the boundaries of technologies we are quite familiar with by innovating and fragmenting the process. But there's there's also different kind of multimodal theatrical um, fragmentation happening. Um, let me just show one more. Think about the stage dynamic, how it is arranged, and the way the narrative is fragmented into multiple production stages. There is a double narrative, one happening on the stage and the other one on the screen, and it is difficult to say which narrative is more fascinating. Um, I, I would say the one on the stage, but. 
The fragmentation of the multimodal storytelling in Kiss and Cry allows for a theatrical narrative that exposes the tensions of creation that would otherwise remain invisible and, and you know, they have to be experienced in, in, the, pre in the present as part of the installation. So kind of to, some, to wrap this, these four examples. Um, what happens if we prioritize effective experience, nonlinear narrativity, over technological innovation. How does intervention, and especially technological intervention, change the experience of art and specifically immersive art? What if we privilege process over outcome and vice versa? While the modes of immersivity in these four installations and performances vary quite dramatically, fragmentation and in some instances, technological intervention are responsible for structuring layers of content, engagement, affect, um, meaning making, memorialization of narratives. These immersive experiences build different ways of viewing, interpreting, and um, you know, memorializing and thinking about very complex narratives. Recognizing them as immersive archives pushes us to, be, uh, to become more open to the transformational implications of immersion in multimodal narratives, where sensory and participatory plasticities will set the stage for what is to come especially within the context of the future and how we want the future to be represented through art. Thank you.